This is another episode of The Blossom Podcast, your number one source for everything bariatric surgery, from pre-op to post-op. Registered dietitian Alex Conception gives you real, raw tips and motivation through your journey. This is The Blossom Podcast. Welcome back to The Blossom Podcast. I have an exciting guest today, success patient, we have Shay Quinn on deck. How are you doing? I'm doing so good. I'm just so excited to be here, come full circle. And um, yeah, it, do, it feels like a lifetime ago that I was listening to your podcast for the first time, but it was really just like a year and a half ago. So I'm excited to be on. Fantastic. Um, so you said that you were listening to the podcast prior to surgery. Mm-hmm. Was was the podcast itself any type of influence to to come on board? Totally. Yeah. So a little bit about my journey. I was hoping to get surgery. Well, once I decided to get bariatric surgery, I was hoping to do it locally. I live in Oregon. And so I had tried to, you know, go go through the program there. But then it was my mother in law who was like, hey, check out Blossom. They can get you in like really soon. I was like, kind of sounds too good to be true. Like I was a little skeptical at first. A lot and of so people. hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it sounds too good to be true. And a lot of times that is the case, but with Blossom, it's not. So I, I, part of my research was definitely listening to the podcast, hearing people's stories going, okay, these people sound like really cool people, not just the people at Blossom, but the patients and their success stories. Like these are normal, like cool people. They're not, you know, I don't know. I just yeah, no, I get, that. Like, I get that 100%. It, yeah. You connected with them. You've totally. connected with them. So yeah. tell us how far out from surgery are you? Yeah. So I just celebrated my one year uh, surge anniversary um, just a few days ago, actually. So um, just one year post-op and um, yeah, feeling great. And what was your starting weight? So my highest weight, um, that's usually what I go based on was 283 pounds. Um, by the time I got to blossom for my actual surgery date. So after the liver shrinking diet, mm -hmm. I was just at about 260 pounds. Okay. Um, and then how I stand today, I'm currently at just about 180 pounds. So, nice. um, I, when I, I measure usually my highest weight, so I've lost about a hundred pounds from my highest down. weight and then 70 pounds roughly from, from surgery date weight. That's fantastic. Are you at goal? Would you say? You know, it's, I don't really know how to answer that because going into it, I didn't really have a specific goal. And even when I talked, you know, with the, with the docs at the clinic and everything, they kind of gave me a range. And honestly, I don't even remember what the range was, but really in this process, I've just been leaning into my body intuitively. And I think I had this block of like, there's no way I could ever lose a hundred pounds. Like it was just wow. that thought of like, once I lose a hundred pounds, like I'll be done. So that's been almost a weird realization in the last couple of weeks, as I've just been naturally kind of losing a little bit more going, wait, my body could settle at a lower weight than what I was kind of anticipating. So um, so yeah, all of that to say, I don't, I don't know, I don't really have a goal weight. It's more of just how I feel. And I think this new next season that I'm going into, I'm really excited to start like toning and kind of focusing more on fitness. And so I, I don't know weight wise how that'll shake out, but it'll be interesting to see. And that's, that's fantastic. And I, I do encourage that mindset. Of course, we come in here thinking that, you know, we do have a good amount of weight to lose. And that's more so for chronic illness. That's to prevent issues down the line. That's because we do have a lot of excess to lose some more than others. But once we get there, what is the point, right? Why are we doing this? Why do we want to have a healthy lifestyle? Why? What's what's next? And that's why I don't like to give a goal weight specifically because that's that's your that's yeah. your prerogative. This is your goal. Nobody can give you a goal, but I can give you milestones along the way. Yeah. And having those milestones make it measurable. It makes it time sensitive. It gives you something that's going to allow you to say no to that drink or that cookie or something like that. But then once you get there, what's next? Right. Yeah. So that's where I also don't like to put an end game either. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. more so for, for mindset as well. Like, 
put another put another milestone ahead of you. Maybe you are where you want to be weight wise, but have you wanted to accomplish something physically? Have you wanted to climb Mount Everest? Have you wanted to run a 5K? These are all big things that we can kind of set for ourselves to where we're not necessarily being in a box because of a number, you know? Mm -hmm. And what do we gain by being that number is always the question. Right. And that's where I had different goals, like, or, or maybe I just had goals outside of physical weight. And so like some of my like metabolic goals going into it is I wanted to have like regular menstrual cycles. I wanted my hormones to be balanced. I wanted to be off my thyroid medication. Um, all of those things have happened since then, which is so cool. Yeah. And, and you even, look fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And, and even just like milestones. So I'm, I'm down in, in California right now, just visiting some family and friends. And my husband and I, we celebrated our wedding anniversary. So we went to a concert a couple nights ago. So I was dancing. Thank you. Thank you. So I was standing at this venue for, I think we were there probably five hours. It's like, I was a little sore after, but I just kept thinking like the whole time, like, oh my gosh, if I like when I would have done this, or if I would have done this at 283 pounds, my body would have been like tapped out. Like I would have just been done. And then the following day after that, I went and spent like almost the whole day at Disneyland with some friends and family. Yeah. Like, doing a lot of walking and rides. And, um, today it's the day after doing that. And I'm like, my body, you know, is a bit sore just from walking, but it's like, I have energy. Like I still feel good to go throughout my day. That was never the case before. It's like at my highest weight going the next day again, I would have just been tapped out so tired. So it's like, those are the things that I was hoping to get out. And so being able to actually see those carried out is kind of surreal like it's yeah. it's awesome to paint a picture for the listeners how tall are you I am about five five on a good day when I'm when I'm standing up straight <laughs> five five 180 you mm -hmm. feel great you can go to a concert and the very next day you can walk around Disneyland ride some rides and we all know that that is miles if you yes. it's miles and it's, and miles. it's it's just amazing not having that mental block anymore of like before it's like, I would really have to get myself like hyped up of like, okay, this is going to be a long day of walking, uh, you know, assessing kind of what's the easiest and quickest way to get place to place. So that way I don't expend, you know, more energy than I have to. And it's just wild being like so much more free of like, I just don't think of that stuff anymore. It's like, I just move place to place. And it's like all of that, that was just taking up so much mind energy is just gone now like that's amazing good good and that's that's ideal that's ideal right and so what's what's next what's the next uh step in terms of your physical journey or or at least uh, milestones that you want to accomplish yeah. So like I said, I, I am really excited about just kind of incorporating more movement in, doing a bit more weightlifting and kind of, you know, seeing how my my body does with that. Um, one of the big reasons why I decided I decided to get bariatric surgery was to start a family and to have kids. And so I'm hoping that one of these days we'll have some blossom babies as I've heard them yeah. <laughs> referred to. And so um, keeping open with that, I, the recommendation I know is like 12 to 18 months post-op is like a good, you know, safe. That's a good milestone, especially knowing that you wanted to have, you want to have a family and mm -hmm. to have kids, things like that. It's extremely helpful for, for a lot of people. They don't realize going in that the body can adapt so quickly to mm -hmm. good and not plan to have to get pregnant you know and those are those are big ones it's like okay we know that you want to have kids but do you want kids now is yeah. the question because the body can adapt and adjust so quickly and and make it happen um yeah. so taking so the, those and, and precautions yes yes definitely and that's been an interesting experience too of just like becoming more in tune with my body i just feel so much more well prepared for care, you know, hopefully God willing, like carrying a child and being in tune with my body for that process, because that's like what the surgery does is it forces you to connect your mind and your body together. And so going through that experience, I feel like has just prepared me a lot for that journey in a way that nothing else really could have, you know, there's going to be a lot that I don't know that I'm, I'm still, you know, 
and open then at to that learning. Point, you can always shoot me an email and I'll yeah. help you along the way. Yeah. You know, because it, a lot of things have to change and the number one shift is going to be understanding that priority is priority number one is the child is going to yeah. be what I like to at least focus on once once you cross that line and we can't be afraid of the scale at that point oh, either. Totally. And, and that's why too it's like I, another goal I guess going into like you know my my next year is just really focusing on nutrition and eating enough food I think that's a misconception Sorry, I got distracted. Miss Alex Conception. Hey. <laughs> um, I think that's a misconception, though, where like a lot of times people will ask me questions like, wow, like you have to change your whole way of eating forever. Like you can only eat small portions. And and for me, I'm working on building up my how much nutrition and food I can take in. So that way, when I do, you know, conceive and breastfeed and all of that, I want to make sure that I'm getting enough food, that the baby's getting enough food. And so um, I've been slowly able to add more calories and eating enough of, of foods that feel good. And so even I think people are surprised a year out what I, what I eat because it, I, I, that's been a priority of mine is getting enough nutrition to support my body. And, um, so I, I kind of do things that maybe a little bit differently than others and that I do a lot of things intuitively and I, I'm not one that tracks calories. I did that for a long time and, and that was really helpful, um, prior to surgery, learning about macros and kind yeah, of 100%. in that way. But now it's like, I, I know the information enough to where I can estimate it well. And I feel really confident in like being able to trust my body in that way. And that's what I like to teach as well as, especially from, from bariatric to bodybuilding, I don't expect you to weigh your food or anything like that for the rest of your life. The point is to establish a foundation for long-term success, is recognizing what portions should be like, recognizing what calories, you know, and how dense, calorically dense certain foods are without realizing it. Because we can easily go overboard, not realizing it, thinking that we're doing something right. You know, but then once you do an actual inventory, it's like, holy crap, yeah, I guess I have been eating pretty horribly. I guess I have been eating quite a bit of calories, you know, but you had already established that foundation early on to where you can be more intuitive ab about it. I like to be a little, a little cocky, you know, and, and this is only in my home and behind closed doors, but <laughs> being able to, in my brain, cut a piece of steak or something like that and say, hey, I bet you this is exactly six ounces, you know, yeah. and I want to say in the 90th percentile, I'm like right on the money, but I can only boast in my in my own kitchen and, and brag with my wife. I don't I don't like to put it out there <laughs> like that, but at least yeah. that's what we're trying to accomplish is to be able to get that awareness of, OK, well, right. this is actually what I'm supposed to be eating. That's a lot less than what I was prior to surgery or that's what I was doing a lot less before I started this program. Right. Well, it's stuff that we should have been taught as kids but many of us weren't. And so like with any new thing, it takes a while to kind of learn and make mistakes and try again. And um, it's just amazing. That's something that is, that will be with us our whole life eating food that we're not, a lot of us are not taught that early on. And so it takes time to learn it, but I, I know what you're saying yeah. as far as like, you know, being able to see something and know, and just kind of be able to make that connection of like, oh, my body is feeling this certain way. Um, what is it craving and why? So it's like, you know, this trip has been really fun and busy and there's yeah. been a lot more movement than I'm typically used to. So what was my body craving? More carbs because it was tired. Like I was yeah. expending yeah. a lot of energy. So I was eating kind of different things and more than what I typically would because my body's like, we're tired here. Like we need some some extra support. So it's it's a learning process for sure. You still have to weigh out the pros and cons on both ends because we can accomplish pretty much anything, but at what cost, you know, because especially for competitors, a lot of people who've never, who are just diving into this for the first time is saying, you know, I want that six pack. I go, well, you have to be okay with knowing that you're going to leave the table hungry if that's what you want, you know, because there's going to be, we can do it in the safest way possible with, with the, with getting the nutrients that you need, but you have to understand that what you're asking for, of course, genetics and everything like that play, play a role. And these are huge factors, but if you are, if you've never accomplished and you're not naturally genetically looking like that, it's going to take a little bit of a lot of willpower, I would say. Um, so you have to weigh those, those things out. 
Totally. Um, I do want to dive into your weight history. So yeah. how, how was your weight history prior to surgery? Yeah. So, I mean, I, this isn't a very uncommon story that I've heard from other people in the bariatric community, but since I was younger, I've always just had excess weight from being a kid. Like it just genetically i I'm predisposed, you know, both sides of my family have struggled with obesity. And so growing up as a kid, I was always like the tallest kid. Like I, I shot up really quick. Like I was the tallest person in kindergarten and I was always like just the biggest kid, like just a big kid. <laughs> and so um, when I got into like in my my puberty years, you know, that kind of adjusted a little bit where I kind of um, kind of a- adjusted out. But I still have always been like a bigger person. Um, I was very active in like cheerleading and dance. And so I oh, had nice. activities like that um, in high school. But then again, this is a common thing. Um, I know I'm not alone in this, but then getting into college, you know, that activity just stops quite a bit. I was working full time. I was going to school full time. I didn't have, it's like I was always doing bad diets all the time to try to lose weight, not understanding nutrition, how to properly fuel my body. And so my body was in a constant state of starving myself and then binging because I was so hungry and going, doing that cycle for years and years and years. And on top of that, I was taking birth control at that time. And so that was, you know, affecting my hormones and not helping or contributing in that way. And so, um, I struggled with excess weight, honestly, my whole entire life. And so then when it got to a point of, you know, after I graduated, from college and I was kind of a bit more stable. I wasn't in school anymore. Um, I was working and kind of had more stability. That's really when I started to dive into learning more about nutrition. And so um, it's interesting in, with my story and that I was properly fueling my body, doing like everything that was supporting my body for about two years before getting bariatric surgery. And what was so frustrating was like, I know I was doing everything I was supposed to, but at that point, my metabolism was shot where it didn't matter that I was doing what I needed to. The excess weight was just holding on. I wasn't on birth control anymore. Like there were lots of things that I had kind of adjusted. Did you get your hormones checked? I did. I got my hormones checked. Um, I was, I, well, I got diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome in 2020, um, which is a, you know, for those that don't know, a metabolic disorder um, relating yeah, PCOS, to PCOS. There's not enough studies to support this, but a lot of testimonies support that bariatric surgery would help with yep. PCOS. Yep. And, that, and I looked into some of those studies that showed that that's one of the, one of the things that um, contributed to my decision and getting bariatric surgery. But so my hormones were just all over the place. I had very high testosterone, um, very high blood sugars. That's not um, hormones, but um, again, it was like anything I did, it didn't contribute positively, even though I was doing the right things that with a normal, healthy metabolism, you would see change. Um, but with mine, I wouldn't see any change. So it was so frustrating. So I'm glad that things worked out and you started trending in the positive direction and and getting your calories and things like that to a place to where you can respond and that's usually what it 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 does require more of an invasive process because this is not just a restrictive diet Mm -hmm. this is not a a just a restrictive approach this is a metabolic surgery this is a metabolic approach and it will help change a lot of those things and this is where i caution a lot of women to um not just women but people in general is if you're doing everything right is to get your hormones checked Mm -hmm. because that is extremely overlooked in terms of how your body can respond and on paper everything is right i'm doing everything right this doesn't make any sense you yeah. were you have PCOS, you know, uh, you were talking about thyroid issues being uh, your your testosterone, and then that will impact your estrogen. And for some women, it is very estrogen dominant, you yeah. know, and doing everything right can inhibit your 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 brain fog, your mood, the the ability to even build muscle mass when you're working out and you're eating protein. What's happening and that can also come from years of um, 
birth control, things like that. Yeah. Too. Your body is was for so many years getting an external estrogen source. And even though you're off of it, your body may be trying to fight that still, you know, exactly. even years afterwards. So um, if anybody's listening who is doing everything right and can't figure it out, it's nobody can say anything without the data. Yeah. You know, otherwise, it's all going to be trial and error. And that's that's a big one, too. Well, and that's, I think, again, another um, common Miss Alex conception. I think you need to like brand like hashtag brand. that. <laughs> I, I like that. Um, I like that, too. <laughs> I like that, too. But like another misconception is like, oh, well, you just have um, bariatric or weight loss surgery just so you eat less and lose weight. It's like, oh, my gosh. And that's what I thought before, too, before looking more at the research. And um, I think what really helped it click for me is what exactly what you're saying. It's like I was doing everything, quote unquote, right, where I should have had different physical outcomes than what I was having. And I can't remember where I heard it, but it just it clicked with me of like, and you said it also, this is a surgery for your metabolism. This is a metabolic reset to help your body function the way it's supposed to. And, and I can attest to that a year later where it's like all of my metabolic mo markers of having, you know, a regular cycle, having energy and, you know, not being so tired all the time, having normal moods. And, you know, that makes sense. Finally, it's regulated because my metabolism is functioning well. And I'm not doing like how I'm eating now um, it's getting closer to how I was eating before still a little bit less. Like I want to yeah. be able to work my calories up a bit more than where they're at now, but I'm eating the same way I was before. And, and my body just finally has the ability to physically show what I'm doing for it. I love it. A lot of, a lot of other issues is that the question and the thought of restrictive eating, you know, is yes, that is a tool but it's because you don't have the surgery or because you don't have a tool to help you stay restricted is that we don't actually stay consistent mm -hmm. and that's a that's a big one yes of course you can do this you can eat 600 calories but how miserable will you be doing it number one and number two how hard will you fall off and how frequent do you fall off because in our brain we only see the good stuff right that right. we're doing but then we only see the frustrations of what we don't want physically mm -hmm. you know so i'm doing everything right i swear i'm dieting and i'm eating this and that and but my body's not showing well you know have you logged your food it's like no you'll realize that maybe two or three times of the week you're actually quadrupling that number without realizing it yeah most of the week you're doing a very low but because you go into those big frequent like a big frequent number change your metabolism can get even more messed up you know you're going some to very lows from to very highs and those are that's just human that's human to be able to burn yeah. out and then we're like oh okay yeah that was that was uh that was a one-off i'm starting tomorrow my diet starts monday i i actually have a shirt that i made that says that diet starts monday it's okay i can have fun right now but you don't realize without this tool how much fun you're having and it's a lot of fun and it can destroy what you've worked on for a week or two weeks and things like that but now with this tool also we keep it we essentially put a ceiling on that you know yes. it's like yeah of course have fun i'm not i'm not i'm not a you know uh, against fun i'm not against um having a treat here having a treat there but you know we need to we still need to regulate it a little bit and totally. we need to put a cap on how much how much we we have uh go overboard and that's why i like to call it a treat meal i don't like to call it a cheap meal because it implies you're doing something wrong you right. know so to have it's a treat shame like party. You're, getting, mm -hmm, you're getting something that you deserve and you've earned you know mm -hmm. so let's earn that meal <laughs> basically right yeah well and just as an example of that I think the consistency part is huge. Like I have built a lifestyle that I love now to where it's not something that is shaming towards me. It's not something that I dislike or get annoyed with. And so just an example of that, you know, we're here traveling in California right now. We were staying in a hotel that just has a mini fridge. But the first thing we did when we got here is we went and we went grocery shopping. Like that's just what we do now. And so it's like we get all this stuff that we would normally have at home because we eat what we what we 
like and we like what we eat. And so, you know, yesterday at Disneyland, like that's not typically what I would eat every day. You know, I definitely had some treats and splurges. As you should. Totally. And it's like, I didn't feel ashamed by that or like, oh, I'm such a bad person for doing that. And I think that's, that's what tripped me up in the past is that shame. And then I would be like, okay, then tomorrow I'm going to punish myself for it by only eating salad. And it's like, that just doesn't work. And so it's like today though, I just am eating more of the foods that I would normally eat. You know, I had yogurt in the morning. I had, you know, a meat and cheese snack, you know, and then I'm having a coffee now. So it's like, I just eat the same all the time, but I'm eating things that I enjoy that I want to. It's just kind of a weird mental shift because for me, vacation always signified, okay, that's when I get to have freedom, freedom from life, you know, to go be doing something fun and food freedom of eating whatever the hell I want. Right. And now it's like, no, it's just, I get to go and enjoy these things, but it's not coming from such a starved scarcity mindset of like, this is the only opportunity I have to splurge. It's, it's not coming from that anymore, which is makes it so much easier. 100%. And, and you hit, you hit something really hard to in terms of punning, punishing yourself the next day. It's not a good idea to starve yourself the next day to make up for the day before. Just get back on track. You're essentially messing up your metabolism even more by doing that because you cannot just erase that day, you know, but also know that you did not essentially mess it up. It's just about getting right. back on track. Just as the first six months has proven after surgery, it's like you felt like you messed it up before then, you know, but you're able to get it to where you are right now in terms of your body composition. So having a, a treat meal or a treat day or you're on vacation. Okay. So enjoy your vacation Hello. at Disneyland. <laughs> let's enjoy Mickey. Let's have a churl, you know, and have a have a turkey leg or something like that. But yeah, you didn't and mess the, it up. Just get back on track the next day. And it may take a few days to to get back your weight. Just don't weigh yourself. Exactly. And, and that's why the weight does. It's a good marker to know, like, if things get like, you know, not within my goals or it's just a good marker to have. But it definitely doesn't define my choices in that in that shameful way. But it just looks a little bit different, you know, with how I do things like I got um for some reason after surgery, I have just been obsessed with like karma. Like when I started incorporating sugar and stuff back in, like, I don't know why, but so yesterday I got a chocolate caramel apple. And in the past, like before my surgery, it's like, I just would have eaten something like that. The whole thing. Now it's like, I just listened to my body. I had like, you know, I just ate a few bites. I probably had maybe like half of it. And then I was like, okay, I'm full. Like I'm done. And then you got to enjoy it. Yeah. Not only that, you appreciate it. You appreciate exactly. those foods a little bit more too. And mm-hmm. um, no, I, I get that 100% too in terms of craving certain things, especially sweet when you cut it out for so long because the pleasure sensors in the brain love sugar, you know, and I've, I was actually never a sweets person until I competed uh, mm-hmm. in bodybuilding into where you take it to that level. The same thing, and, and I've said this before that I haven't recommended anything that I haven't done myself in terms mm-hmm. of body composition and lifestyle. So to take it to those extremes without the tool, right, is also taking it to those extremes in your brain as well. So for somebody, for a child who didn't really eat cake at the, at the birthday parties or uh, cut out the frosting, not because of health, but because I just didn't like it to eliminate sugar in my brain, something switched to where, man, I'm craving a cake right now. I want like a cookie or something, but that's how, how we can kind of cause a little bit of triggers, but also the awareness is big, you know, and knowing that, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to kill the apple. I'm not going to kill the cake or the cookie. Just have a couple bites, kill the craving. And then mm-hmm. and then get back on track and with the with this tool leading with the protein. That's why I always say if you can't yeah. control it, always lead with the protein and veggies and it will buffer, you know, and if yeah. you you're utilizing this tool to the best of its capacity by filling it up and then you're essentially forcing your body to not go overboard when you right. do have an indulging bite. And my body craves that now just naturally. And and I knew like, you know, the, the day I was going to have yesterday. And so it's like I just started it with a high protein. You know, I did yogurt in the morning 
morning and got, you know, a big boost of protein with that first, just to kind of start my day off with that. And then towards the end of the day, it's like I I had had a baked potato that had a little bit of protein that wasn't, you know, a lot in there. I had, but towards the end of the day, I ended up getting like this pot roast dinner thing. And it was like, my body was like, okay, girl, like we got to get some more protein. And like, it just told me what it needed, you know? Yeah, exactly. Good. So tell me about the first six months after surgery. Did you have struggles in, uh, and what, what were they? Yeah. So first six months were interesting, um, as they are for many, but um, really the first three months, the interesting thing that I had that I hadn't heard a lot of people talk about that I'd like to talk about just to know if other people are having that, or if you've heard of this, but I had a lot of like excess bleeding, like, um, where I just, it was like, my system was just getting out a bunch of stuff that it had stored up for a long time. So that was kind of challenging where, um, you know, I didn't have regular cycles until probably about seven, eight months post-op. Um, I have some theories as to why I think that might be, but I also want to be careful because I'm not a doctor. I don't want to say for sure, but that was something that, um, I wasn't anticipating and I was working with like, um, you know, my physician and my, uh, I had a pelvic floor physical therapist who helped me out a lot. Um, so that was really challenging. And, um, the thing that I found that was hard with that too, is, you know, in this, in the first six months with the program guidelines, you're just supposed to have, you know, after you get done with your liquid and and yeah. kind of move on and graduate to food, um, just protein and veggies for the most part. The thing that I found challenging about that is because I was having so much excess bleeding, I was feeling so tired and fatigued. And so I actually incorporated, and again, this was kind of, you know, I don't recommend going against program guidelines or or I recommend working with people to figure out, but I I was working with my physical therapist and my doctor with this, but I incorporated some carbs a bit earlier on at about three months, like doing sweet potatoes and regular potatoes. And that seemed to help a lot with like just my energy, but Um, that was one of the things I was not expecting that was kind of like, Ooh, this is weird. Um, and then I think also too, I was surprised with like the anxiety I experienced after, like, I just had a lot of anxiety, like going back to work. And I think just because my system had been jolted so much, it was weird integrating back into normal life. And so that took like, again, probably the first three months were challenging in that way. So I'll stop with that. But those were kind of the the two big yeah. things that, that were interesting to me. So like I said, this is a metabolic, um, this is a metabolic procedure. And the fact that you were having some hormonal issues prior to surgery, this is your body was really trying to figure things out, you know, and that that does make sense. I wouldn't say it's it's common, but it happens, you know, and it, and it wouldn't not necessarily be seven, eight months for a lot of people, maybe a little bit less in that regard, but I'm glad that things are stable now, but I just couldn't tell you like to what degree and I've heard, I've heard of it, but it always levels out as well. If you do everything that you're supposed to be doing. And even the fact that you did incorporate carbohydrates, everybody is different, you know, and how you respond is a little bit different having the protein and veggies. And, and I like to say too, I don't like to demonize fruit. I don't like to demonize carbohydrates. They do have their merits. They are good for you. It is the fact that it took a certain relationship with food to get you here. And that is why I'm trying to disrupt that, you know, and create a foundation for long term success rather than being able to try to balance everything right off the bat and ending up where you were mentally six, 12 months down the line. You know, we didn't really change anything. We didn't take anything to an extreme beyond the fact that, okay, well, I guess I'm restricted right now, but I I didn't really stop eating anything. (laughs) You know, it was just smaller portions. So that is the foundation of why I like to do it that way in terms Mm -hmm. of leading with the protein and veggies, but not having carbohydrates. But I also like to eliminate processed carbohydrates. That's a big one. So being able to do fruits in the form of berries antioxidants fiber vitamins minerals doing whole grains you know versus the doing the just a white rice or something like that even potatoes white potatoes there's it's it's extremely nutritious you know there's a lot of potassium in there as well same with with uh versus sweet potato anyhow you know there's there's uh benefits on both ends and there's still whole foods it's still uh vegetables and all of those things 
but we are also restricted. So that's also why I say, as long as you lead with the protein and, and non-starchy veggies, we're still working towards that ultimate balance because as time progresses, things get easier. You know, uh, pain will come down, inflammation will come down, and your ability to test your limits will increase. So um, if you don't establish those those fundamental principles in the beginning, we're going to end up to where we were afterwards. You know, and then what your, your specific body, you know, experience in terms of your frustration, that is common number one. Anxiety and all of those things, there's just a lot of life change period mm -hmm. you know and no pun intended on the period but having <laughs> the <laughs> having the irregular menstruation and having excess bleeding is because your hormones are trying to adapt and adjust you know and i am very glad and i encourage what you've done in terms of working with other healthcare professionals and making sure even an endocrinologist you know and yeah. making sure that hey Everything is actually fine, you know, and I want to know that we're trending in the positive and in, in the positive direction and being able to incorporate some carbohydrates and things like that's not going to destroy you, as we've seen with you. Yeah, well, and it's it was kind of scary at first because I'm like, I was like, you know, what do we do when we like, or what do I do? I I like look up on Google, like, what could this mean? You know, this isn't something that I was prepared for, you know, but also After just Google. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's like, just also to just understanding how hormones work a bit more. And maybe you can shed a little bit more light because you are more clinical than I am, Alex. But um, I know with estrogen, it can be stored in fat cells. And one of the things that I noticed right off the bat where I lost weight primarily was in my hips and like, you know, butt area. And mm -hmm. that's where I had a lot of the excess fat in there. And so I, all, uh, that's kind of what my hypothesis was, is that as that was losing weight first, that's where a lot of the estrogen was stored and it needed to get out a certain way. Does that match or are you able? Yes, to no, absolutely. That? And and that, and I can attest to that as well. The estrogen and the fat, it, it, they do, they can work synergistically and it can also help you or hurt you synergistically as well. Now, when it comes down to fat cells, they don't actually disappear. So that's the problem. And being estrogen dominant or anything like that, yes, they do shrink. And had you been a certain way prior, you are vulnerable moving forward if you let yourself go. You know, but fortunately with this tool, that helps number one. And if you were to do any type of like um, liposuction or anything like that, yes, that would help tremendously. So we're just shrinking the fat cells, but you are vulnerable to still be able to gain those, uh, gain that weight back. Fortunately, with this tool, it's gonna it's gonna prevent you. Number one, with the with the uh, with the ghrelin, with the hunger hormone, the the actual physical restriction, and then the changes in your in your hormones. But going through those ups and downs, yes, it's gonna it's gonna make it's gonna make an impact. Although you are still vulnerable, you're less vulnerable than somebody who hasn't gone through that and who hasn't had this tool as well. So, um, yeah, that's good to get that like uh, confirmation, I guess. And just cause like, it's helpful just for me to have that understanding of kind of like why that happened and, and where, you know, to just like what to look out for in the future. And yeah. I think part of it too, that I've, uh, the other thing that I was thought was interesting is after the surgery, because I had done a lot of work on noticing actual physical hunger cues and kind of working on my metabolism, I was surprised that after the fact, I really did feel hungry. And I know that's a good meta. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. I I've been told that that's a good metabolic marker that your metabolism is functioning well, that you feel hunger cues. And, um, so that was interesting too. And I, I think what was kind of something that contributed to where, what got me, you know, to weight besides the fact that obesity is a disease and all of the, those kind of things was having such a legalistic mindset and black and white mindset of how I approached food and stuff. And so getting the surgery, I was like, I don't want to screw this up. I spent money. Like I invested in myself in this way. I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to follow the program to a T. And I was so like, um, kind of like stressed out about doing that. Like one, if I make one little thing, that's not part of the blossom handbook, like 
I'm, I'm over, I'm done. And so I think that was an interesting experience for me to go, you know, okay, like, even though this isn't the program guideline, at some point, I have to take accountability and ownership of my own body and what feels right to my body, getting support and people and, you know, understanding and information from other people. But ultimately, like Shay knows what's best for Shay, like, and, yeah, and I think it's, it's just interesting that, um, I always thought that I couldn't, I couldn't trust myself because that's what got my body to where it was before. But now I'm realizing it's because I was taught not to trust myself. A lot of that is what got me there. So it's just interesting because it's, it, it's kind of counterintuitive or it was to me at first, but that's been cool to learn. Did you see, did you speak with a counselor or anything? Oh yeah, I've been, I've done, I, I, well, prior to surgery, I did a lot of therapy on uncovering, you know, like lots of, of things in regards to that. But then after the surgery, I say that's, that was my catalyst to just really dive into just working on, you know, past childhood traumas and, you know, all that stuff yeah, that yeah, takes a lot absolutely. of work to do. And so, um, yeah, I, it's just funny. I, I was telling my husband, it feels like this last year has been like 10 years just because there's been so much growth in such a short amount of time. And so, yeah, the mental and emotional part has definitely been the hardest and most consuming part for me. Um, but also like the best part it, it's, it's just, it's been really cool. Well, that's good. And having that experience and that awareness is huge because yes, you don't have the hunger hormone, okay? But, and I, I explain this all the time, is that you cannot replace a lifetime of experiences with food and how we determine what is what can be a very gray area. And for the most part, and I wanna say 90% of the time, it is more head hunger than physical hunger, but what else are you, what is going on? Did Are you adapting and adjusting? Are we still early on? Did you incorporate more weightlifting or anything like that? Did you just have a crazy active day, you know, and or your body was induced to some kind of crazy trauma that, yeah, it's your body's going to it's going to ask for energy, you know, and energy meaning calories. So when it comes down to recognizing is this a is this a head hunger? There's also a very, very strong, empowering tool of resistance the resistance being if i tell you you're not supposed to do something you want something you know so i'm not supposed to be doing this therefore i want this and my brain and everything in my being is going to say i should be having this because i'm just telling myself not to and that's just you know fundamental neuro-linguistic programming that we do and and um well, I've been reading a lot into it and it's it's become very much aware too that like, okay, yeah. I, and, and it's how you say it to yourself as well. You know, it's, you're not going to tell yourself, I'm not going to do something because our body essentially can't do a negative, but right. you can tell yourself that you're going to live today in a very positive way. And you're going to eat in the, the calories that you want to not, I'm not going to do this, you know? Right. And therefore I've had our to, body wants that. I've had to work on that a lot with the language I use because there's so much power in that. So it's like in the past, you know, I would say things like, yeah, like I, you know, I can't eat that because it's bad or, you know, and now it sounds like, you know what, like that sounds really good right now. I feel like it might make my stomach upset, but you know what? I'm going to try it. I feel like I'm, I'm in a place where I, I can try it. And even just changing those, those things, it's, it's a bunch of little things that add up. And so I try to be very mindful of that with language and just for myself, when I'm talking about it for myself and to other people, um, cause it, those, our words have power in that way. So much power. And I want to use a, an example too. So when I say that, when, when you don't want to do something or you tell yourself not to do something, we in our brain we want to if i were to tell you um don't think about a purple dinosaur you're gonna do it right, right. in our brain like, how do i just not do that but if i told you to think about a red one you still aren't thinking about a purple one but now you're just thinking about a red one so this like that's hopefully that makes sense in terms of yeah. not doing something versus just telling yourself to do something that's positive you know and yeah. that way we will our bodies and our minds will be able to kind of uh, progress in that, in that way. You know? Yeah. 
And the interesting thing too, like talking about where we were talking a little earlier about the mind body connection thing, what I found too, that was so interesting is, you know, I had the surgery, which was obviously contributing to excess weight loss, but I had multiple stalls along the way. And the one thing I, I can tell you every single time was the case. I'm a very pattern oriented person. And so I just found this pattern really interesting. Every time I would have a mental or emotional breakthrough, I would see a physical reflection of that literally within the next day in a, so positive, would, way? In a positive way. Yes. Or, or, or in a way that I was losing excess weight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it would be like, I would be on a stall for a little bit and then I would, you know, have therapy or just, or just realize something within myself. Usually it involved lots of crying. I, I swear I've cried more in this last year than I have my whole life. And then it was literally like the next day I would go, the scale would go down five or six pounds. It's just interesting how all of that is connected or that I've seen it connected within myself of like, there's so much mental and emotional weight that I've been carrying. And to see that reflected in my physical body has been so fascinating. It is. And I love that you're aware of that and in tune with that too, because once you are, uh, I try to explain as a lot too, especially with the short amount of time that I have to speak to certain patients is that like, well, beyond all like the entire check marks that we're doing physically, are you stressed, you know, and what's going on in your life right now and beyond everything on paper, it's like, oh, you just lost somebody. Oh, you're going through this. Oh, you're going through that. It's all of those things. And, and even to add on the added stress of reaching out to me because you're frustrated is going to add to that cortisol levels that's going to increase and it's going to allow you to hold on a little bit more and just letting go and crying and reflecting on those things and knowing that you had progress mentally is going to translate physically and the hormones are going to you know your your cortisol is going to come down you're going to have a uh, and it's not even just a, a a metaphorical release you you know you have an actual physical release as well which is fantastic and i and i love that and hopefully well, so i can teach that a little bit more too or maybe you can teach it. i don't know what you're doing these days but that yeah. that would be really awesome yeah, well, it's just interesting because my whole life I've just been from stress response to stress response, meaning that, you know, going from situation to situation, never fully coming back to having regulated cortisol levels or, you know, not, you know, not being able to be regulated. And a lot of that comes from, again, like as kids, we weren't taught how to do that. And so this season has been a process of learning that for myself, stuff that um, I should have been taught as kids, you know, and again, I'm not like putting blame on parents or anything because they didn't know either. Um, but it's just like a process of reparenting myself and teaching myself, oh, wow, I have emotions because I'm a human being and it's okay. I don't have to have those stuff down all the time. And um, yeah, so I'm trying to bring more awareness to that and just some in it by just by sharing my journey and being honest and um, I joke now, you know, it's like, I just usually most cases I'm like, you're just going to see me cry all the time because that it's like years of buildup that it just, it has to come out somehow. And I might be like that the rest of my life, or maybe as things stabilize more, that'll lessen. I'm not really sure, but at least you know that it's healthy, yes. you know, to, to do that and, and let it out. And that it's good. It's good. If you, if you need to, you know, just yeah. grab that pillow, just grab that pillow, you know, or, or, or that friendly shoulder. Um, would I be out of line if I asked you how old you were? Yeah, no, not at all. And that's another thing I love sharing because I, again, I, I just feel like my experience is maybe a bit more unique. I, I think more, more situate, more people that are similar to me will get bariatric surgery in the upcoming year. So I'm super happy to talk about that. So I just turned 28 all right. and yeah, yeah. So I was 27 when I got the surgery and, um, you know, I think going into bariatric surgery, I just, you know, we see all of the um, kind of stereotypes that are out there, right? My 600 pound life, people yeah. who are morbidly obese and usually older, like, um, you know, 40s and up is is what I, the typical patient or person that I've seen that have had that's had the surgery. Um, so in that way, it's interesting that I was, you know, I'm still in my mid to late or I, well, now I'm in officially in my late 20s, late but when 20s. I got the surgery, you kind of categorize <laughs> it as the late 20s. 
Um, and I'm so, so grateful. I got it when I did, I got the surgery done when I did, because instead of having more years of trying and just banging my head against the wall, like I, I feel pretty confident and saying for my body, it wouldn't have mattered what I did. Um, I needed that metabolic reset. So I'm just thankful that I got it done early um, to have that to where I can just like live my life. Yeah, um, more years it, of happiness. And yes. when you do have a family, you know, you're able to instill those fundamental principles to your child. Mm -hmm. And not only that, to be able to participate in your child's life rather than trying to figure out your illnesses that you may have had, had you not gone through this journey. And of course, this is not that you can't do this without it. It's, it's just extremely helpful. And this is your story that, that is um, enlightening for I'm sure so many people. Well, and that's like the most heartbreaking thing that I've seen within the community. You know, I have a podcast with two other bariatric patients, one that's in uh, Michigan, one that's in Canada, and um, they're in their 40s and dads and, you know, have multiple kiddos and their tipping point was, um, you know, just that they couldn't spend time with their kids the way that they wanted to and just hearing the pain in their voices and, and what they feel like they've missed out on. It's like, you know, they made a different choice moving forward and they're, you know, which is awesome. But I think just hearing that has just driven home even more, just the gratitude I have of doing this now before having kids. And, um, cause it's hard, like those years you don't get back. And, you know, and like I said, yeah. They're doing things really well now, but it's just the pain that and like the regret that I hear in their voice. It, it's like, I'm just really, really grateful I got it done now. How old are they, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, they're um, one just turned 40. Shout out to Rob. And then the Ooh. other one, Murph, is uh, 41, I think, almost 42. Oh Fantastic. That's great. And I'm, I'm going to be on your podcast as well. And I'd Yeah, love we're excited to, to have you. There. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's awesome. Um, We've been talking for like an hour almost, right? I want to I want to say, is there anything else that you would want to impart to the listeners in terms of anybody considering bariatric surgery? Number one, and anybody who has had surgery, what what would you recommend in your experience? Yeah, I think like this is kind of the message I try to drive home, and it applies to both scenarios or any scenario. If uh, just any human that's listening, it's you know, that you are a worthy human being, not based on what you do or what you don't do. And you can fill in the blank with that, not based on your weight or, you know, what you, um, if you've lost weight, gained weight, stayed the same, um, you're a worthy human being because that's who you were created to be. And so um, I think having that shift within myself of recognizing myself as a worthy human being has driven a lot of different decisions um, this last year than it did before. And so I think that's been the most helpful thing that I've learned in this time. So I think that's like a good, just like general message that everyone yeah. should know. <laughs> no, 100%, 100%. Know that you're worthy. And I like to say that you were made with purpose for purpose, on purpose. <laughs> right? I love that. That's good. I want to get a bumper sticker with that. I like use that. it. Use it. It's <laughs> yours. Um, so where can people find you? Plug that yeah. podcast. Yeah, you bet. It's that's another outcome I was not expecting when getting surgery. It's like now I've really dove into content creation. And so I'm sharing my story and meeting cool people along the way. And so um, yeah, so I have a YouTube channel. It's um, Grow with Shay, G R O W with S H E A. Um, so I'm I'm sharing my story on there. I'm I'm very active on Instagram, Grow with Shay there as well. I'm on TikTok reluctantly. I don't love TikTok. It's not my favorite, but I'm trying to keep up with the times. Me uh, too. I just started getting back into. I actually, I'm sure you're very busy. I'm very busy, but that's that's the times right so i actually yeah. just got a new uh TikTok as well and it's it's the right life but it'll <laughs> awesome. i understand i understand yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like just roll with it and you know embrace the fact that it's not my favorite but i'm finding fun things in that but i'm definitely more active 
it with the Instagram community. And so that's kind of where I spend the majority of my time with that. Um, but yeah, and then I also have a podcast with the, with Rob and Murph, who I was talking about before yeah. they both had bariatric surgery also. Um, and that's called the waiting table, but a little play on words. We spell it W E I G H T. So we uh, have waiting that. as so in wait. your weight on the scale. You got it. You got it. So we have a live podcast every week. Um, so yeah, check us out. But Instagram is usually the, the best way to find me and, and feel free to say hi. I love talking with people on there. So let's grow with Shay on Instagram, TikTok and YouTube, The Waiting yeah. Table with Rob Murph and Shay. And yeah, that's awesome. I love it. And I'm sure this is not going to be the last time we're going to be speaking. We actually didn't have our nutrition, your nutrition consult with me. You had it with <laughs> either Abe or Will, you know, they're, they're no longer here, but you know, I'm glad that we got to connect. I'm glad to see that you're, uh, you were able to use the resources that Blossoms provided and the podcast, this podcast, it's evergreen. I know I don't post as often as I should, but you know, it's not often I get to, you know, encounter and, and block out the time with awesome, with awesome patients like you, Shay. So that's what's um, so cool about it. It's like, or that's what I appreciated about it. Everybody's on a different timeline with their journey. And so it's like the content that you do have out there it helped me a lot when I was researching and trying to figure out like what I wanted to do. And so that's, what's so cool is like you create stuff and then sometimes it doesn't even help somebody until it's like years later. So yeah, I, I love exactly. what you're doing and I'm just so appreciative to you and to blossom. And yeah, I'm excited to work with you guys more in the future. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And we got a lot of awesome snippets today and great value. I'm sure the patients will find, and I'm sure that you've re you've related to, or a lot of people have related to you in this conversation as well. So uh, we will chat again soon, right? Okay. And I will yep. see you in the next. Peace. Peace. <laughs> This was another episode of The Blossom Podcast. For more motivation and future episodes with Alex, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any life-changing moments.